specific stimulus. I'll come back to these more complicated channels in a little while. The simplest kind that consist only of the pore seem to be the right kind to try to see how the potassium conduction process works. And one from a bacterium, Streptomyces lividans, its signature sequence shown here in the top, um, called KCSA in identified in Hilgen Schrempf's lab, uh, seem to be the best candidate to pursue to determine the structure. And after a focused effort, my laboratory determined the structure of the shaker potassium channel after defining, finding crystals that would diffract x-rays well enough. And there were crystals of the type shown here in this picture taken at a synchrotron. Now this first structure was to 3.2 angstroms resolution and it took four additional years to identify crystals that would diffract x-rays X -rays to better than two angstroms resolution. And here's a diffraction pattern from those crystals. And this defined the chemistry of the potassium channel at the level we need. The blue mesh is electron density. And you can see in here potassium ions held by the protein. And this is what we were after, this kind of understanding. Now this effort has been a long effort and it's been a team effort in my lab. But I want to mention a few key postdoctoral scientists who have worked on this. One is Declan Doyle, who worked on the initial structure from the beginning until the end of it. Another is Joao Marai Cabral, who worked on the initial structure and then did, worked in, on deducing the mechanism of the ion throughput that I will tell you about. And another is Yu Feng Zhou, who finally determined the high resolution structure, determined the absolute occupancy of ions in the selectivity filter, and determined, figured out a new principle for high throughput rates that I will tell you about. This is the, shake, this is the KCSA potassium channel with its four subunits colored in different colors. The top is on the, the extracellular part is on the top the intracellular on the bottom, and the ion conduction pore runs down the middle between the subunits. This you can see better in a simpler representation of the channel with two subunits removed, and we can see just two subunits with the pore down the middle. The blue mesh shows ions and water lined up along the ion conduction pore. And when we look at this, you can see that the ion conduction pore is very wide in the middle of the membrane. It's wide enough so that an ion there is surrounded by water. It remains fully hydrated. And this structure has interesting helices that are painted in red here, called pore helices. They're pointing the C-terminal end of these alpha helices towards the center of the channel. And each subunit points one there. You can see two here. The C-terminal end of a hel alpha helix is associated with a partial negative charge. And remember, Potassium has a positive charge, and you have the negative end of an alpha helix pointed at it, and that makes sense to help stabilize it. Now, remember in the beginning I told you the fundamental issue of the cell membrane is an ion doesn't want to enter the oily substance in the middle. But what we have here, you see in the structure of the channel, is a pore that allows an ion to remain hydrated at the center, deep within the membrane, and it points partial negative charges at that ion to stabilize it. And so this makes sense for allowing an ion to cross the membrane. Now what makes this a potassium channel is the selectivity filter shown here in yellow. Here, potassium ions are held in a dehydrated state. This structure, the selectivity filter, is made by those signature sequence amino acids. And we'll look at a closer view of it here. What you see here are carbonyl oxygen atoms shown as red sticks all pointed in one direction from each subunit at the center of the pore, and they interact with potassium ions that bind at four positions, labeled one through four, from the outside. These carbonyl oxygens act as surrogate water molecules to hold the potassium ions. Looking at this structure, we can tell why nature has conserved this sequence 
The glycine amino acids are special because they easily sit in the left-handed helical region of the Ramachandran plot with their dihedral angles. And so we effectively have LDLD amino acids here, a sequence of alternating L and D amino acids, and that's what allows the carbonyl oxygen atoms to point to the center to interact with the potassium ions. The hydrophobic valine and tyrosine side chains point directly away from the center, and they're packed in a hydrophobic core to give geometric constraint to this structure. Well, here we'll look at another representation of this. This is the selectivity filter with the four ion positions. If we look at a potassium ion in any one of these positions, a potassium ion sits in a cage surrounded by eight oxygens, four on the top, shown as little red spheres, and four on the bottom of this potassium ion. And so it sits in the center of a cube of oxygens, oxygens from the protein, or a twisted cube called a square antiprism. Now a hydrated potassium ion that sits in the wider part of the ion conduction pore below the selectivity filter has water molecules around it, and it shows us something very beautiful. The potassium ion with water around it has eight and has four on the top and four on the bottom. And if we now compare a potassium ion in the selectivity filter with a potassium ion in water, we see why this is a potassium channel. You see that the protein here has, a, has made sites that mimic the hydration shell around a potassium ion. That's what nature has done with this structure. And this selectivity filter allows ions to move from one site to the next in, a, in an environment that is like water, but it is the protein. These sites are the right size for potassium, and you might ask, what happens if I try to take the potassium out of this structure and replace it with the sodium? If you do that, what you discover is the structure doesn't maintain itself. Here is the structure we're looking at in the presence of high concentrations of potassium with the ions in four positions. Here is the structure in three millimolar potassium and about 150 millimolar sodium replacing the potassium. It looks different. You don't see four positions. I'll come back to this structure. If the point for now is it's different. We call this a collapse structure. And what this means is, in fact, the selectivity filter is truly tuned for potassium such that its structure requires potassium to be maintained. Okay? Now, when we look at this, we see four positions. But actually, if we ask, what is the occupancy of each of those positions? You find that the occupancy is approximately one half at each. That means half the time a potassium ion sits there. The reason you see four peaks is because in a crystallographic experiment, this is like a superposition of photographs. So you see an average position of where the ions are. On average, there are two potassium ions in this selectivity filter distributed over four sites. And in fact, from experiments that I don't have time to tell you about, we know that those two potassium ions tend to sit in two specific configurations that I show you here. Here is one picture, potassium as green and water as red. So the configurations, one, three, are potassium, water, potassium, water, or water, potassium, water, potassium. And what we're looking at here is kind of a, a combination of these two configurations. In fact, one hint for that that I said is that if you look at the electron density just above the selectivity filter, you see that potassium, there's a, there are extra potassium ions out there. And in fact, a cation is drawn to this region of the protein in the crystal because it's very electronegative. It's a lot of negative groups up there. But it doesn't sit in one energy minimum place. It's actually distributed over two positions that are spaced equal to the spacing in the selectivity filter. And an explanation for that is that the potassium ion out here actually feels the distribution of ions in the filter. And in the 1, 3, it's pushed further away. And in the 2, 4, it's drawn further in. Okay. But these two configurations, 1, 3, and 2, 4, it's interesting because they sit at the ends of a very simple throughput cycle that I show here in a simpler representation of the filter where the potassium ions are green, 1, 3, with water in between red. 
one three configuration can just go over to the two four by the cue of potassium and, I, potassium and water just moving, shifting in this direction. So they can hop here and hop back through thermal agitation. They would imagine you'd, they would move back and forth. But imagine when you're in the one three position, a potassium ion can enter from underneath and move the cue as an ion exits from the other side. And so a complete turn around this cycle, one turn corresponds to one ion going through. And in fact, this is just a little cartoon to show you what I mean. I don't show the waters in between the potassium, they would be implicit here, but you'd have thermal vibration of the ion water cue in the selectivity filter and then you'd have movement of an ion. And of course, this is a completely passive device. So the direction of the cycling is dictated completely by the electrochemical driving force of the ions. It can go in either direction. Um, but the point is, you always have two potassium ions in that filter, and a third one comes through, and one pops out the other end. Now, remember in the early on, I raised a paradox. And that is, how did nature come up with a device that has high selectivity and high throughput at the same time? And I'd say one of the explanations for this is that if you look at the filter, it has ions in it that are very close together. It has multiple sites and ions that are closely spaced. The mean center to center difference, distance between potassium ions in the selectivity filter is, is just a little over six angstroms six to seven angstroms. They're quite close. They both carry a positive charge, so they'll tend to repel each other. So I would say that an individual site would have a high affinity for potassium, but because you have ions close to each other, the ions repel each other, which will lower the affinity. So that's one of the explanations for why you could have high throughput, why the ions won't stick too tightly, and you'll have high throughput in the setting of high selectivity. But there's another explanation. And that has to do with this structure of the selectivity filter that I showed you in the presence of low potassium concentrations. This is looking again at this collapsed selectivity filter in potassium concentrations less than five millimolar. What you actually have here is on average one potassium ion distributed over two sites and the filter is a little bit hourglass shaped. In fact, it's pinched kind of shut here in this collapsed configuration. And this is the filter we've been looking at, the conductive form of the filter in the presence of high concentrations of potassium. So the filter in low potassium concentrations is here, and in high concentrations, it's here. Now certainly, when ions are conducting rapidly through this device, it's not undergoing this conformational change. That's because one reason is because when a potassium channel is opening and opened and conducting, ions are going through at a very high rate, and the potassium concentration inside the cell is very high. So you're in this regime or this condition uh, of conduction. So in a sense, you could say this collapsed state of the filter is a laboratory phenomenon. You know, It's something we see in the laboratory when we lower the potassium way down. But in fact, this laboratory phenomenon has meaning. It's telling us something about the selectivity filter, that it's doing a trick, actually. It's, it's, it's made to do a trick to ensure that ions don't stick too tightly. And let me tell you why I say this in a little thought experiment. Imagine if the selectivity filter maintained its structure, even when we lowered the potassium concentration, so that it maintains its conformation for conduction, even when there's only one potassium ion in it. Then, when going from the one ion state to the two ion state, you could say that the free energy from left to right here would just be given by the binding energy of this second 